Coming up on the DMT One to One Show, episode 57, on the 24th of April 2014, an interview with Oscar Hoglund, CEO of the company Epidemic Sound. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT One to One show. Uh, the show comes out every week and covers uh, some of the best uh, startups and uh, music projects uh, in the digital industries. And so this week it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome Oscar Hoglund, the CEO and uh, co-founder of Epidemic Sound. So hi Oscar and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi Andrea, it's very good, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you and so uh, today we're going to talk about the company, of course. Uh, You're uh, based in Stockholm and uh, let's start by uh, giving us a quick overview of what Epidemic Sound is and what it does. So Epidemic Sound is a production music library. Uh, We're based out of Stockholm and what we're uh, aiming to achieve is we want to unchain production music that you use in visual content. And we're looking to help creators become much more creative and to regain control over their content by using music from us, which can be fully licensed in a true one-stop shop. And when do you have the idea for the company? The idea came to us around about 2008, 2009. At the time, we were running a very big Scandinavian production company, and we were deeply immersed in storytelling. And obviously, as you guys know, music plays a huge part in storytelling. And it was becoming increasingly difficult for us to find, source, pay for, and use music that was going to be used on multiple platforms in multiple territories for multiple periods of time. Sure. So we came up with the idea of making everything very, 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 very simple. And I guess you could say to some extent we were inspired by Daniel and the guys over at Spotify who launched the model where you pay for access instead of ownership. So we decided to do something similar. And we launched a model where producers of video content, be them small MCNs or be them large broadcasters, pay us a fixed monthly fee and they're free to use as much production music as they like. Awesome. And so uh, in that sense, that's how uh, the company was born. Uh, but uh, uh, sort of walk us through the process of uh, how Epidemic Sound works uh, uh, from uh, uh, you know, the perspective of somebody that wants to license some music uh, from, from the company. And then we can go back and look at the perspective of, of a creator that wants to license music to your <coughs> company. Uh, we went to the biggest broadcasters and we uh, contacted them and said that we had a proposition Yeah. where, where we said that um, we think that you guys use tons of music that you want to use in your audiovisual productions and we think that uh, it's a much better value proposition to pay for access instead of paying for ownership. Right. Um, so we launched the concept of uh, paying a sub- fixed subscription fee to get limitless access to our library of ever going, growing tracks. Sure. Um, so we started with a few broadcasters in uh, our home country, Sweden, and we had very positive outcome in the tests. So we started adding eventually every single broadcaster in our home country, Sweden. Yeah. And then we started adding broadcasters in uh, Norway and Finland and Denmark and pretty much all of Scandinavia. And the concept is that we have broadcasters who pay us a fixed fee. They get access to our uh, repertoire of music. Uh, everything is online. They, in turn, can grant access to production companies who work for them externally. And it really is a one-stop shop. We include all the rights. You get to use the music and the content when it's broadcast, when it's put online, when the secondary exploitation and things like that. And it's a system that's been uh, very well received because I think it's very transparent, very easy, quality is very high. And we've brought uh, a new structure to, um, to how this works. And so let's turn it around and try and look at the perspective of uh, uh, a composer that wants to join the service. So uh, what are they required to do and you know, what are the requirements to be able to produce music for Epidemic Sound? Yeah, um, I think that there are a number of different aspects you can talk about here. Um, one of them was the starting point. We felt yeah. that um, the old system where we are obviously are very different from it uh, was a little bit of a lottery in the sense that uh, you would write a track, uh, you would produce it, you would submit it to a, a library, and you were in no way guaranteed that your track would get paid and that you eventually would be paid royalties. So in our world, we see that a little bit as uh, an aspect of a lottery in- included there. Uh, we wanted to change this around. Um, so what we did is we put our money where our mouth is, and we said that uh, we want to listen to your music, and we're willing to pay up front for everything that we want to buy. And you, we pay a fixed right. fee. We put it in the library. Um, that track may never get used, uh, or it may get used several times. But we sure. pay a fixed fee up front, um, and the composer is guaranteed um, that he or she uh, gets remuneration for it. Um, I think it's, it's probably very important for us to point out here also that we obviously have limitations to how that track can get used. 
Um, so broadcasters can't use that track indefinitely at sort of very high re-rate runs, so let's say vignettes or channel idents, because that obviously gets used a lot. And so then we have a separate system where we pay the composers significantly more. So we paid out millions of crowns, which equates to hundreds of thousands of euros for individual tracks that get used a lot. That's awesome. So looking at uh, uh, the, the restrictions, so one, one of the core things that is, uh, I guess, for some composers could be a problem is the fact that uh, the, uh, a lot of the societies that are out there today, like the PRS, for example, here in the UK, don't allow uh, composers to opt out certain works. So yeah. a composer either has to be without a, a collection society or be with a collection society and there's no halfway. So I guess in your case, the composers have to make the choice that if they're making really good money through epi epidemic, it makes sense for them to just not be with a collection society and stay with you guys, right? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, and this is something that we um, have um, taken into um, account when we work with people because we're very um, concerned about uh, creating the best possible situation for composers. Right. And if, com if composers currently are registered with a PRO, then what you're saying is exactly true. Um, they can't opt out uh, specific pieces of music and sell to us. So uh, we have to tell composers that if you are with a PRO and you're happy with that, then you can't work with us. Yeah. Um, so all the people who work with us are currently not with PROs. They either never have been or they've decided to leave them because they're seeing that they're not being able to sustain their livelihood on being part of PROs and then we're an alternative. Yeah, sure. And so looking at the, the catalog that you have, uh, what is the selection process and you know, how would a composer go about uh, you know, being a part of the Epidemic Sound experience and how do you filter through the noise essentially? Mm -hmm. So just to give you some scope initially, I could say that the library is today roughly between 25,000 and 30,000 tracks. Yeah. We cover something like 180 different genres. Um, and the selection process I would say is very, very rigorous. Um, we've had I'd say tens of thousands of musicians and producers from around the world who have uh, seek to join us. Um, and I think this has in part been driven by a number of different things. Um, one of them is obviously that two of my co-founders are very famous music producers. One is David Stenmark and the other one is Per Ostra. And a little bit of what we offer is, is a community in the sense that uh, we tell people that they should uh, apply to us because what we do is we offer you uh, training, we have workshops, we fly in people, we give tips about plugins, instruments, we write, invite uh, composers, uh, TV editors, uh, videographers, and so we have workshops continually. Um, we also have uh, individual listeners, so every person who starts working for us gets an individual listener who's in charge of their creative process and development. So you get feedback from a team of um, senior listeners, there are currently about 10 of us here, um, who know exactly what the composer, what he or she is doing, how they're developing, what kind of areas where they need help. Uh, we give them inspiration and we also give them guidelines telling them that this is the kind of music that we're looking for. Yeah. So once you've actually been accepted here, uh, we tend to buy, I'd say about 95% of all the music that the musicians create for us because we know them so well, we coach them so well, we yeah. create a very sort of creative and safe environment for them to be super, either if they want to be productive and make a lot, because some do, and some are very selective and they may only make a few tracks a year. And it's completely up to them and we want to give them complete control. So there are no minimum guarantees. You don't have to create any number of tracks for us. It's, it's completely up to you. Yeah, sure. And so uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, the ways in which you can uh, expand the business, uh, so w what are your main targets uh, uh, in Europe and beyond? Uh, uh, you know, having been already in touch, I guess, with uh, most of the major broadcasters, uh, you know, w w w what is your horizon uh, looking like at the moment in terms of uh, mm. uh, expanding Epidemic's uh, business? Yeah. Um, for us, it made a lot of sense to start with the broadcasters for a number of reasons. Uh, one was obviously because we knew the industry very, very well. Um, two, because they were very sophisticated buyers. The broadcasters right. and the production companies, they know music very, very well. And so we've been in that space now for almost five years. And we feel as though we have, uh, we have the quality, we have the quantity, we have the processes in place. Um, and so we started to get a lot of reach out from um, other areas which were close to broadcasting but weren't traditional broadcasting per se. Yeah. And one, one of them was from the multi-channel networks, so the maker studios of the world and the full screens and the um, media crafts and the MCNs all around the world. So we started uh, entering that area about two years ago. 
I now think that we have maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of all the M big MCNs in the world are customers of ours now. So we yeah. supply, you, those of you who don't know what MCNs are, it's the multi-channel networks on YouTube. So a significant amount of the music found on YouTube now comes from us. Um, we then saw expansion in another other, uh, areas, obviously one being online, which is huge. And because storytelling is going from very uh, tech-centric and then very picture-centric to becoming very video-centric, yeah. um, you obviously need a lot of music. So we're seeing big Fortune 500 companies from around the world uh, reaching out and saying that our new storytelling is very much centered around video and we want to have music and it has to be simple and the quality has to be great because we're telling a fantastic story. Yeah. So we started growing into that space as well. Um, and then there's another interesting space, which is the in-store radio space. So we work with a number of big chains all around Europe and to some extent in the US as well, um, where they're seeing they have multiple distribution spots, they have multiple locations where they want to have music being a part of their experience. And we can offer a lot of value, a lot of simplicity. Um, so that's an area where we're growing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, looking at the, the policy side of things, uh, we're talking about the fact that a lot of uh, uh, song artists are locked in with their current PROs at the moment. Uh, do, do you foresee that uh, there's going to be changes in that respect uh, over the coming years where uh, writers are going to get a degree of flexibility as to what works uh, get administered by a certain uh, PRO and what works don't get administered by them? Um, I, I hope so. Uh, I mean, in a dream scenario, that's something we see in the long run, which, which probably will happen. Um, I mean, we like to emphasize, though, that uh, we have a tremendous amount of respect for PROs because they have a very, very wide uh, range of uh, chores that they're trying to cater to. Sure. Um, we are super focused because our mission is we want to be uh, the best supplier of production music for audiovisual content. So yeah. we're in a position where we can be very focused, we gear our business model to cater to these needs, we gear our production, we gear our music, we gear our culture very much uh, towards reaching that goal. A PRO has a much, much wider scope that they have to cover. Um, and I think it's going to be a gradual process. I think we're seeing great steps taking place both here in Scandinavia, but also in the US now currently we're seeing that rules are being changed a little bit and the same goes in the UK as well. Um, and we're setting up offices in more and more markets. So we, we just recently opened up in Holland and we're looking to open three to four more countries in the coming six months. So uh, talking about uh, Stockholm, uh, what is the uh, startup ecosystem like over there? Uh, of course, uh, Spotify is one of the big stories, but uh, uh, what's, what's the feeling in the city? I have to say it's fantastic. Um, we've been in this space now for about five years and it's so encouraging and it's so stimulating to have companies like Spotify coming out of Stockholm Obviously, SoundCloud, now based in Berlin, but they're a Stockholm company as well. So I know both Daniel and Eric and Axel and, uh, and Alex and all those guys. Um, and it's, uh, it's a tremendous burst, not only to be here locally, but also internationally. When we meet people, it makes so much sense when we say that we come from Stockholm, we do tech, we do music. We immediately get a lot of traction, a lot of coverage, and it really helps the ecosystem just grow exponentially over here. Now you were mentioning uh, uh, multi-channel networks, and you've recently mm -hmm. also closed the deal uh, on a blanket a deal with a, one of those uh, that actually will provide uh, uh, all of the video makers with the music from Epidemic Sound uh, as a sort of uh, uh, for their video. So w can you talk us a little bit about uh, tell, tell a little bit about that and uh, and how that uh, came up? Yes, yeah, so I think that. When it comes to MCNs, it's obviously a, a very exciting space. Yeah. Um, we recently saw that Disney acquired uh, Maker for a very large amount. And uh, we've been in this space for two years now. Um, I think that one of the things that we find particularly interesting and where we're able to be um, very attuned with the business model is the fact that MCNs are still a very young industry. Uh, very much characterized by rock and roll. Um, that there are short times where you make quick and big decisions. Yeah. And so I think that what we found is that our model has been uh, very well suited to help them sort of find their way going forward. We have a variety of different mid different business models. We have, uh, as you mentioned, blanket licenses for big customers. Um, we have uh, pay-as-you-go where you pay per second of usage. Yeah. We have per program stuff and we also have um, uh, individual subscriptions if you're a separate channel on YouTube as well. So I think the fact that we own 100% of all our rights and that we are very flexible and that we're, we realize that we're part of a new industry which is trying to be born as, we, as, as we're actually talking now has given us um, a lot of benefits and 
we see tons of people sort of reaching out to us every single week saying, I read about this deal, I read about this, we'd like something similar. So we have multiple discussions ongoing now, and I think it's a very exciting space. That's cool. And so if, if there were artists that were listening to the program or, you know, uh, self, uh, I guess you're looking for 360 producers that can produce the entire piece of music, right, and present it to you mixed. Yes, exactly. So um, I would definitely recommend that they go in on epidemicsound.com and they can yeah. send us music through that. Um, it is just as you're saying, Andrea, we are looking for a special type of composers who can both write, perform and record it uh, themselves. Yeah. Um, currently, we see most of our musicians and, and our creators, they come from either Scandinavia or from the US, but we're very keen to find, obviously, creators from all over the world. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, well, Oscar, it was a pleasure. And uh, the site is uh, epidemicsound.com, right? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. And the tw uh, Twitter handle is uh, epidemic underscore uh, sound if you want to tweet the company as well. And so uh, whether you are uh, uh, somebody that's looking for music for your own uh, videos uh, or for your network or whether you are an artist or a producer and you're interested in uh, having a chat with these guys, definitely worth uh, checking out. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for your time, Oscar. Thank you so much for having me, Andrea. And thanks for listening to the DMT One to One Show. You can find out more on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.